Turn in your King James Bible to the book of Acts, chapter 26. Acts chapter 26 and verse 16, down through verse 21. Paul's on trial here, and he says, he's telling the story about how Jesus came to him on the road to Damascus. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Hmm. Why were the Jews so anxious to kill Paul? Because he was preaching to the Gentiles. And what was he preaching to the Gentiles? That they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Prove that your conversion was genuine, in other words. So, today I'm going to talk about what is the gospel of today. The gospel that we preach, if you're a Bible-believing Christian, is salvation works repent and turn to God salvation and do works meet for repentance that's the gospel that Paul preached right there and that's the gospel that a lot of modern day uh, Christians don't want anything to, anything to do with okay and I'm going to show you there are three types of salvation the real one and two false ones let me explain, okay? The real one works like this. Here's true biblical salvation. You have Jesus Christ. Christ dies on the cross. He sheds his blood to pay for your sins, okay? He says, it is finished. So you come here and you get saved I get that right once it is once and done right there saved once all right you say well good then that's it that's just faith alone faith alone uh, no, they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Saved once at the cross, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then your second salvation begins, which we'll talk about here as we continue. And this one will last the rest of your life as a Christian. And I'm going to draw it going up. Because as you get older as a Christian... Your life is going to get closer and closer and closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the whole purpose of it. All right? You begin to walk the narrow path that Jesus Christ laid out there. Not to get you saved. Not to get you eternally saved. That already happened back here. This is now the second salvation. All right? Paul writes to Timothy at one point in time, and he says, In doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Another time he says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What's he talking about? He's not talking about this back here. He's talking about this here. Okay? So I'm going to call this your second salvation. Okay? First salvation is right here. You're saved once. This means you're going up. Okay? The resurrection, you now qualify. You are now part of Jesus Christ. You're part of his body here, okay? But if you've lived a ter terrible, wicked life back here in your sin, 
you get saved, well, that takes care of eternity. But now what do you do about your life? The Bible says, let him that stole, steal no more. Okay? The life of sanctification begins. Why? Because stealing is negative. Okay? If you're a thief and you come to Jesus Christ to be saved and you continue as a thief, you're not going to get too far in your second salvation. You're going to end up in prison or whatever else. You get shot or something for invading somebody's home because you continue in your thieving ways. All right? That's not what biblical salvation is all about, just continuing in your sin. No, no, no. No. And you say, well, then this, this means you're sinlessly perfect. Well, if you became sinlessly perfect right here, well, then there's no need for the second salvation. There's no need for works meet for repentance. You see? Now, let me show you the other two types of uh, salvation. Okay? Secondly, we have, uh, I'll say it this way. I'll use a nice big red here. Go about like this. And I'll make it a cross, a sideways cross. And over here, you have a nice big question mark. You say, what's that? This is works. Works salvation. Okay? You say, what's the cross about? Well, instead of having the cross back here, a past event where Jesus Christ dies on the cross to pay for your sins, you remove that cross and you say, I have to take up my cross. Kind of like uh, Catholic soldiers that had the cross on their shield, the Crusaders. This is Roman Catholicism right here. It is, there's no saved once. It is finished over here. It's a life of bearing your cross, all for the greater glory of God. I am a corpse in the cause of Christ. I'm whatever. It's all about working. And at the end, you say, do you know for sure you're going to go to heaven when you die? No, we don't. That would be presumptuous, a sin of presumption. We can't really say for sure if we're going to be saved. We have to die in a state of grace without committing any mortal sins. And if we do, well, we might have to go through purgatory for a while or, or have a death mass said for us or whatever else. See, the cross is your life. That's what this is right here. This is also, I will say it this way, Catholic and Lordship Salvation. You see, both of these omit the cross of Jesus Christ. I'll put a cross back here and then I'll put a now I'll just put a black circle around it like this and like that through it. Both of them say the cross of Jesus Christ it was a nice thing but it's basically there just to kind of show us the path of salvation. All right? That's what this one's all about here. Just move this thing forward a little bit. What's the third type? Okay? The third type of salvation is, uh, let me see here, I'll say, um, hmm, what should I use? So hard to figure out which collars to use. The third type of salvation I'll put down here, I'll just use blue for the cross like this, and uh, then I'll get my black again, this one here will be, uh, I don't know what you'd want to call it, um, belief, alone. All right, and all this one is is intellectual.
That's all it is. And again, you get over to here. And again, they don't really know for sure. They can think, they can surmise because they have intellectual belief. We've believed. They say it's faith alone. Faith alone is salvation. Um, well, as I've described, uh, the Bible never says faith alone. It's by grace through faith. Grace is God's part. Faith is our part. So if you're saying faith alone, then you're saying you're the author and finisher of your salvation. Uh, but that's what these people are down here. Okay? In other words, there is no good works. It's just a maintaining of intellectual belief. I'll write belief there too. Intellectual belief and no works meet for repentance. Okay? That's the three different types of salvation. This is the genuine one up here, and these two are fake. Right there and right there. Salvation works. The two salvations of a real genuinely saved Christian, you have saved once here at Calvary. It's finished. Eternal, your eternal salvation is done. That's why you can say, up here, you can say, we have eternal security. You see? Why? How do you know that? Because we're not basing it on this. We're basing it on that. Down here, do you have eternal security? Of course not. There is no past event. Faith in the blood of Jesus Christ there that he shed on the cross as death, burial, and resurrection. There isn't anything like that. Okay? There's no imputed righteousness. Your righteousness is what gets you to heaven, you see. So these people down here, they can claim that we believe, you know, in eternal security. Uh, they don't really. They're, uh, they're constantly questioning and wondering if they're really truly saved or not. You know, that's what this one is down here. All right. This one down here, they can claim eternal security, but it's only because of intellectual belief. And again, you say, were well, you genuine, genuinely saved? Well, they don't have to have any works to prove it. It's all just, well, I believe back here and I can live however I want to live. There's no second salvation here, like true biblical salvation that Paul preached. Salvation works. Okay? You understand that? And it's interesting because if you look at the thing, this group down here, they want this, but they don't want that. This group here, they want this, the life of sanctification, but they don't want this. Coming to Jesus Christ as a sinner and saying, I'm no good, and the Lord is the only one that can save me. Oh no, they don't want to give up on themselves. They want to say, it's my own righteousness, it's my own sinless life that gets me to heaven. Okay? Now one of the confusing, confusing things that will come in here, when a Bible believer like myself preaches true biblical salvation, which is salvation works, I'll say sometimes up in here, you're not right with God. And people think, that means I'm down here. No, I'm not. You can be saved over here and messed up here. Christians can live in all kinds of sin. I've seen, seen Christians, Bible-believing, fine, saved, born-again Christians, that get messed up here, but they got this right. That's the difference there. And again, these people that are down here, see their intellectual belief, they're dead spiritually, so they can't understand when a Bible-believing preacher is condemning the sins and life of a Christian and saying, you're out of fellowship with God. That's what I mean when I say you're not right with God. You're out of fellowship. They don't get it because they're dead in trespasses and sins, you see. And anytime they hear a sin rebuked, they automatically try to make it into a salvation issue. All right? It's not always about salvation as far as over here is concerned. All right? It's very important to get that. What this is about right here, this is about you cleaning your life up so you don't make a mess of your life. And as you go through your life and the Lord starts to convict you of sins and things like that, you're going to live a much better life, a much happier life. I can tell you uh, a lot of the sins of my past, uh, back before I got saved and even right after I got saved, shortly after there, um, a lot of those sins were very self-destructive, extremely self-destructive. And I would have been a fool to try and say that I could have just continued to live like that and it would have been no problem. 
I can just live however I want to live, just down here. No, it doesn't work that way. There needs to be works made for repentance, a changed life that comes. Okay? It's not down here. I'm not saying I'll eventually get to heaven, I think, maybe, perhaps. No. It's I'm saved, but I'm, I sure made a mess of my life back here before I got saved, and I had to come to the Lord and say I want to go from the power of darkness to light, from Satan's kingdom to God's kingdom. I want a changed life. Now, Lord, help me to start living more for you. Getting closer to the Lord. All right? That's important to understand here. So, I preached a message like this many years ago, showing the three different types of salvation, and some people still don't get it. A lot of people out there, they still, they still think uh, that I'm preaching here uh, when I'm not. Okay? I do not believe in Lordship salvation. Catholics working their way to heaven. All right? But why? They exclude this over here. There is no finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross that pays for your sins, and then his imputed righteousness comes. I mean, think about imputed righteousness. If this is where you're at down here, what good is imputed righteousness? What's it doing for you? Why do you have to have Jesus Christ's imputed righteousness? Because you're a miserable critter, you see? <laughs> and you're going to have to clean your life up after you get saved. Works meet for repentance, you know? But his righteousness has to be imputed to you. Because this doesn't work down here. And uh, let me just say this. You say, well, uh, I know somebody and they're having a hard time with alcohol. They're really uh, struggling in things with, with uh, alcohol addiction. Uh, you say, do you know what works? Yes, I do. Salvation works. So what are you, what are you talking about there? Um, well, if you're having a problem with alcohol addiction... You're a drunkard. Uh, what chance do you have being down here with belief al alone? All I have to do is believe in Jesus Christ, and then it doesn't matter how I live. I can live however I want to live. There's no works meet for repentance here. There's no repenting of sins, in other words. You just say you believe back there. I have faith alone in something that happened in the past, and nothing changes. Uh, that's not going to work for an alcoholic. You say, well, uh, Mr. Alcoholic, you got to give up your, uh, your drunkenness. you got to give up this, this wicked life that you're living. Um, so you need to come to church. You need to do a lot of good works. So eventually you can get saved over here. That doesn't work. What well, works? Salvation works. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And now he can start cleaning up your life. The porn addict. Um, just understand that Jesus Christ died for your sins. Well, will I go to hell if I keep looking at pornography? No, no. You go to hell for not trusting in Christ, they say. Oh, well then I can, uh, you know, kind of just keep doing this down here. No works. As long as I have my intellectual belief over here. Hmm. Handy little system you got there. Hey, pornography addict, uh, the way you need to get rid of it is you need to join the church and take the sacraments and holy orders so that eventually you can be saved. Uh, yeah, that works out for the Catholic Church, doesn't it? Um, a lot of sex perverts in that system. No, what, what, uh, what's the solution? Oh, uh, salvation works. The gospel that Paul preached. Jesus died for your sins. Uh, I come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. They that are whole will have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. Okay, Mark 2.17. I got the wording of it mixed up there, but look it up. Okay. It is a faithful saying and worthy of all expectation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Okay. And that's Paul writing that. Now, if Paul had continued as a Pharisee, and continued persecuting Christians, what would that have meant? He would have had this down here. Intellectual belief. And no changed life. No, Paul shows us what a Christian is supposed to be. Saved. Over here. And then your life changes. And you get better and better as time goes by. Salvation works, you see. 
That's the solution for man's problems right here. It's not a solution down here. This is not a solution. This is bondage. Okay? This is bondage. And so is this. You say, well, how is this bondage down here? Very simple. Because you see, you never really know for sure. You just make a profession of faith and then you go with this argument for a while and you go with that theological book and then you go with this one and you go with that one and you and you just you're guessing your whole life. You're still in bondage. You're not really free. You claim, oh, I have my belief over here. I've believed in Jesus. I believe he died for my sins, but where's the changed life to prove it? Uh, your life is a mess. That's why someone comes along like myself and I preach the truth about uh, all sorts of different issues and these people down here get mad at me. Nearly everybody in this camp down here was a former follower of this ministry. Almost every one of them. What was the problem? They have their belief that's intellectual, but their works don't match up to up here to true biblical salvation. And what happens is when I hit one of their sins that they don't, they don't uh, like to have talked about, you see, what happens is they get angry and then they'll turn against me. This group up here, you're saved, you understand that you're saved, and now you're trying to clean up your life, and all of a sudden you hear a certain sin that you're doing, a certain thing that you're guilty of, it's kicked up here, and you feel it. And the difference is, this group here gets mad at a preacher like myself. This group up here hangs their head in shame and says, Oh boy, well, I really, really need help with this. I can't tell you how many letters I've gotten over the years Brothers and sisters in the Lord saying to me, I really thank the Lord for your sermon, brother. It really convicted me. I'm doing wrong. I'm not right with God. They're saved, but they're not right with God. Okay? They're out of fellowship with the Lord, in other words. That's what I've preached since the time I've been in ministry. Okay? Repentance of sin. This is the majority of your life as a Christian. This is the tough part right here. This over here is easy. Okay? Just understand that you're a sinner. I mean, how hard is that? And come to God in an honest spirit and just simply say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I can't get to heaven on my own. Uh, I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins. I'd Please, God, would you please save me? That part's easy. This part here is described as a war. In Galatians chapter 5, the flesh and the, and the spirit war against each other. Romans chapter 7, Paul's talking about the, the good thing that he would, that he knows he should be doing, he doesn't do, and the bad things that he knows he shouldn't be doing, that's what he does. Paraphrasing, of course. But you can read it, Romans chapter 7. This is the tough part in a Christian's life right here. That's why these two groups, they get away from this formula up here. That Paul preached. So I pray that you don't fall into this group or into this group because these two groups, they both end in question marks. This one here, they'll, they'll claim, oh yeah, we, we understand. We understand that we're going to get to heaven when we die, but uh, they can't really prove it other than just through intellectual beliefs and things like that. They can't really prove it. Why? Nothing changed. Okay. <laughs> I can tell you that uh, uh, I can tell you all kinds of things. I believe um, I believe I have a spaceship parked outside of my lane. What does that mean? Can't prove it. I'd need to grab that camera there and walk outside and show you the spaceship. You know, I believe that I can uh, bend bars of steel with my bare hands. Okay, get a bar of steel and prove it. I can. I believe I can fly through the air like Superman. Okay, walk outside and prove it. You see, I believe I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, but uh, my life didn't change. Nothing happened. It's a problem. Both of these systems here will lead to hell. Okay, I'll put that over here. Both of these systems lead to hell. Right there. That's in reality where you're going to be going if you believe in either of these two systems. Like that. Up here, this leads to heaven.
And I'll tell you what, it's a blessed thing to be able to have the kind of life where God saves an old, wretched, miserable sinner. I mean, you come to the Lord and you say, uh, I, don't, I don't think God would ever want me. Boy, I sure have messed up. I've been through divorces. I've had uh, bad relationships. I've been an alcoholic. I've been a drug addict, a porn addict. I've been, uh, I've been in and out of jail over the years. And What would God want with me? He died for sinners. Are you a sinner? Or are you a good person? Are you a good person that can be down here or uh, down here? You see? These two systems lead to hell. This one leads to heaven. It's a beautiful thing. Because God will not only save you and give you an entrance into heaven when you die, He'll also help you to clean your life up. I can tell you right now, I'm in better physical health today than I was back as a lost man in my early 20s. I got saved when I was 26 years old. And I was, you know, in fairly good shape and whatever else, but I was living all kinds of wicked things and doing all kinds of wicked stuff. I was not happy. All right? When God saved me and gave me an eternal place in heaven there, then He started to save me this way. And every day my life gets better and better and better. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. You don't have that down here. And you definitely don't have that down here. How can things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose, when you believe that there's no works that follow salvation? How can it all work together for good? You didn't have to give up any sins or anything else. You didn't have to say, I want to change life here. Come to God as a sinner. You see? It's just a general knowledge and you just say, well, I, hey, everybody sins, I guess, you know. So yeah, I can just, I just believe that Jesus died for my sins. I don't have to change anything. I don't have to, you know, when I go to work, I can still cuss with my friends and, and still laugh at the dirty jokes and still womanize a little bit, still get drunk on the weekends. Well, yeah. How's it all going to work together for good if you do this down here? It won't. And this certainly isn't going to lead to work together for good either. All this does is just put you in bondage to some religious system like Roman Catholicism or a lot of the Calvinistic system. So that's it right there. If you ever see anybody out there and they say that Brian Denlinger teaches Lordship Salvation, uh, they're lying. I just showed you I don't teach this. Brian Denlinger teaches uh, works salvation. No, that's not true. I teach salvation works. Salvation does work. Anything that you're messed up in in life, any kind of a problem that you have, whatever else, salvation is the only thing that's going to work for you. You get saved, go to heaven when you die. And then God will help you to clean your life up. Right here. This is the only help that you can get for the problems that you're going to run into. I keep talking and talking and talking on this, but uh, the fact of the matter is, if you don't get it, there's not a whole lot I can do for you. All right? Um, salvation in this current time here is extremely simple. And, uh, you know, I will say one thing, and that is, this is the plan of salvation for right now. All right? Um, there's going to come a point in time when the Lord's going to catch up His bride and say, come up hither. And uh, we're going to go up. Uh, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm looking forward to that time. But when that happens, this plan right here is over. This isn't going to be anymore. You can't just say, well, I got saved, and now God's just going to kind of work some things out. No, no, because you see, when the body of Christ leaves, there's a new thing that's going to happen. You can claim to be saved, but now there's going to be a thing on the earth called the mark of the beast, which the Bible says in Romans chapter 14, if any man takes the mark, worships the beast and his image, he gets God's wrath. Romans, Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 11. You can read that. And Re Revelation chapter 14, uh, verse 12, talks about the faith of Jesus and keeping the commandments. Things change in the future. This promise is only for... 
a time here, what we would call the church age, as dispensational Christians. The church age is going to end one of these days. And uh, if you're left behind, you're going to have a real rough time of it. Okay? Because both of these systems are going to lead you to hell in that time period. And uh, they lead you to hell right now, too, by the way, I might add. So, that is going to be it. I pray that you take these things to mind. You put these things in your mind and, and remember them. Think about them. Salvation is here. Okay? This is genuine biblical salvation that Paul preached. Your first salvation is at the cross. That determines your eternity in heaven. Second salvation is your life of sanctification. You can do things in this life to get out of fellowship with the Lord. You can mess around and sin. You're not going to have sinless perfection. We'll get to that here in just a minute. There is no such thing as sinless perfection in this system. You're going to want to do things that are right and you will fail and fall. And preachers like myself will rebuke your sin and get you under conviction. The Holy Spirit will use me and others like myself to put you under conviction and say that thing needs to go out of your life. You're saved. But your second salvation is in a wreck right now. All right? This is true biblical salvation. This down here works Catholic Lordship salvation. This thing here excludes the cross. It's not a past event. It is a continuing event where if you ever mess up, well, then you weren't really saved. You never really were saved and whatever else. Okay? Again, I don't teach that. People lie about me. They say I teach that. I've never taught that. All right? What happens is, you have these people down here, and there's nothing here, but yet they claim there's no works meet for repentance, like we read about earlier in Acts chapter 26. They claim that they have belief alone. And what I do is I say, okay, uh, you're getting the cart in front of the horse, as they say. If there's no change here, then you didn't make it back here. You didn't come to God as a broken sinner, like up here, you see. There needs to be works meet for repentance. All right? You have to be spiritual to understand this stuff. All right? You have to be spiritual to really truly understand. I'll say it that way. If you're just an old wicked sinner, you understand. I've talked to so many wicked sinners over the years that balk at salvation and say, I, I just, I don't know if I'm ready yet. I don't know. What, you know why? Because they understand this here is easy. But this is the part here that they dread. This is the part here. They don't want to have to go to work and face their buddies. They don't want to have to face their family. Their marriage could fall apart. They could lose their job. They worry about all kinds of things because of this right here. You can fake this. You can fake this. You see? You can say that you have it, but in reality you don't. This here, when the Lord starts to come in, He starts to change your life. You're not going to be able to fake that. So, that is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching.